Good morning. A few announcements before we begin our worship service. Uh, this uh, service will be recorded. We'll have it posted on YouTube for members who are not able to be here. It's also uh, live streaming. Um, does everyone have a communion packet from the back? If you don't, you can go ahead and raise your hand and we'll make sure you get one. Um, so, um, there are also individual packs available in the, in the tote in the church carport, so you can contact us if you need uh, communion packets if you're worshiping at home and have need of that. Um, please just let an elder or deacon know and we'll make sure that um, we get you those or you can stop by and pick them up from the carport. Um, just a reminder about our Wednesday night Bible study at 7 p.m. There is a link on the website. That's always a really in encouraging and educational uh, time. It's, it's just, it's very uplifting in the middle of the week to be able to be together in that way. Um, and the more little rectangles we see, the more encouraging it is, really. Um, so, uh, some more announcements. We have uh, Mez and Olivia expecting baby number three in September, so we're very excited for them on that. Um, Tony Malta is home from uh, Shelby Nursing. So keep him in your prayers as he continues to recover. Peggy Gates is home uh, battling COVID. Um, she's doing some better after an IV infusion, um, but she is, she's battling that along with, with so many others. Um, Paula's dad, um, Marvin's sister-in-law and nephew, um, Shirley's granddaughter, Olivia. We, I'm pretty sure with, you, you see the numbers, you see the news, and I'm pretty sure we all know somebody who is currently uh, battling that. So remember to continue praying for those um, that we know about, those that we don't. Um, Courtney Reese is uh, still recovering from her ankle surgery, so keep her in your prayers. Um, Elizabeth's co-worker uh, passed away. Please keep the family of Pam Cushingberry in, in your prayers. And as was announced at the end of last week's service, um, the furnace fund is officially uh, settled. It's, uh, it's paid off, so we're very um, encouraged and thankful to the, the members of the congregation who stepped up and got our AC and, and heat fixed up here. And we know how it can go from 40 to 80 overnight, so it's gonna be really nice to be able to have that AC <laughs> coming on when we're all masked up. Um, so we're, we're very happy to announce that. Um, after closing prayer, we'll dismiss from the back of the auditorium and proceed outside. It's a gorgeous day. Um, so uh, those are all the announcements I have. If you have any others, please let me know. Um, we'll make sure we get them added to the announcements. Um, now if you would bow with me for a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we come to you at this time so thankful for the opportunity to be here, to worship you and sing songs of praise to your name, Father. And we pray that we continue to strive and grow in knowledge of your word, in spirit and strength and boldness for your word, Father. We know that we cannot be too bold for, in, in your name. We, we just, as long as we are, are, are standing on your word. Thank you for those who are about to conduct this service, those who have made it possible to uh, utilize the technology so that those who, who could not be here are still able to hear your word and sing, and sing praise to you. Father, we thank you for the ability to be one of heart and, and, and one in your son's blood. Pray that we are open and attentive to your message and truly focusing wholly on, on your glory. In Christ's name, amen. Good morning. Please turn your songbooks to him, to him number 517. 517. 
If you're able, please stand. If we have it, let's sing. Trials dark on every hand and we cannot understand all the ways that God will lead us to that blessed promised land. But he'll guide us with his eye and we'll follow till we die. We will understand it better by and by. By and by, when the morning comes, all the saints of God are gathering on. We will tell the story how we overcome. We will understand it better by and by. We are often destitute of the things that life demands. One of shelter and of food, thirsty hills and barren land. But we're trusting in the Lord and according to his word. We will understand it better by and by, by and by, when the morning comes. All the saints of God are gathering on. We will tell the story how we overcome. We will understand it better by and by. Temptations, hidden snares, often take us unaware. And our hearts are made to bleed for each lawless word or deed. And we wonder why the test when we try to do our best, but we'll understand it better by and by, by and by, when the morning comes, all the saints of God are gathering on. We will tell the story how we overcome. We will understand it better by and by. Please be seated. Scripture this morning is taken from Romans, Romans chapter 1, verses 1 through 6. I'll be reading from the ESV, Romans chapter 1. Paul, a servant of Christ Jesus, called to be an apostle, set apart for the gospel of God, which he promised beforehand through his prophets in the Holy Scriptures concerning his son who was descended from David according to the flesh and was declared to be the Son of God in power according to the spirit of holiness by his resurrection from the dead, Jesus Christ our Lord, through whom we have received grace and apostleship to bring about the obedience of faith for the sake of his name among the nations including you who are called to belong to Jesus Christ. Will you please pray with me? Dear Heavenly Father, we come to you so thankful this morning, dear Lord, for all the many blessings you've given us, most of all for your Son. 
We are thankful, dear Lord, for this opportunity we have to come together to worship you, dear Lord, to sing praises to your name, to read your word together, to hear your word preached, dear Lord, to gather around the table and commune with you. We are so blessed to be your children. We pray, dear Heavenly Father, that our worship this morning is edifying and uplifting to everyone here. But most of all, we pray that our worship is acceptable to you, dear Lord. We are prayerful, dear Heavenly Father, for those who are mentioned in the announcements who are grieving, who are suffering loss, dear Lord, who are, who are battling COVID, who are battling other health problems, who are healing. We pray that you will just wrap your arms around your children. Pray, dear Heavenly Father, for the leaders of this congregation as well as the leaders of your church worldwide, dear Lord, we pray that you will guide us, bless us, dear Lord, give us your wisdom and the courage to follow that wisdom, dear Lord. We pray for the leaders of our nation, the leaders of countries all over the world, dear Lord, we pray that they will have the wisdom to seek your guidance and when making decisions, dear Lord. We pray for peace. We pray for kindness, dear Lord. We pray that there will be a softening of hearts around this world and people will lead more with kindness and less hate, dear Lord. We pray that you will continue to watch over us and bless us all these things we pray, dear Lord, in your Son, Jesus' name. Amen. Before we lay in communion, turn with me to hymn number 747. Hymn number 747. <clears throat> Let's sing. Jesus is Lord, my Redeemer. How he loves me. How I love him. He is risen. He is coming. Lord. morning I'd like to read to you 
from the book of Luke. I will read from the New Revised Standard, chapter 23, to describe the crucifixion of Jesus, beginning in verse 26. As they led him away, they seized the man, Simon Cyrene, who was coming from the country. And they laid a cross on him and made him carry it behind Jesus. A great number of people followed him, and among them were women who were beating their breasts and willing for him. But Jesus turned to them and said, Daughters of Jerusalem, do not weep for me, but weep for yourself, for your children. For the days are surely coming when they will say, Blessed are the barren, and the wombs that never bore, and the breast that never nursed. Then they will begin to say to the mountains, Fall on us, and to the hills, cover us. For if they do this, when the wood is green, what will happen then when it's dry? Two other also who were criminals were led away to be put to death with him. And they came to the place that is called the skull, and they crucified Jesus. They're there were the criminals, one on his right and one on his left. And Jesus said, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they are doing. And they cast lots to divide his clothing, and the people stood by watching, but they led, scoffed at him, saying, he saves others. Let him save himself. He is the Messiah of God who has cho his chosen. The soldier also mocked him, coming up and offering him sour wine and saying, If you are the king of the Jews, save yourself. There was an inscription over him. This is the king of the Jews. One of the criminals who were hanged there kept deriding him and saying, Are you not the Messiah? Save yourself and us. But the other rebuked him, saying, Do, not, do you not fear God, since you are under the same sentence of condemnation? And we indeed have been condemned, justified, for we are getting what we deserve for our deeds. But this man has done nothing wrong. Then he said, Jesus, remember me when you come into the kingdom. He replied, truly, I tell you, today you will be with me in paradise. It was now about noon, and darkness came over the whole land until three in the afternoon. While well, the sun's light failed, and the curtain of the temple was torn in two, then Jesus cried with a loud voice, saying, Father, into your hands I command my spirit. Heaven send this, his breath is last. When the centurion saw what had taken place, he praised God and said, Certainly, this man was innocent. And when the crowd who had gathered there for the spectacle saw what had taken place, they returned home beating their breasts. But all in acquaintances, including the woman who had followed him from the gallery, stood at a distance watching this thing. I wanted to share this passage with you today as a reminder of the innocence of Christ when he died for us, yet through all of the suffering, he pleaded to God to forgive us. Let's not forget he had taken human form, and with that came the human suffering, the physical suffering. He was not exempted from that. And yet, in his obedience, he got up on that cross for us, given his body, given his blood. He's still pleading to God to forgive us for what we did. This time, if you would peel back the first layer of the communion kit, it gives access to the, to the bread. Let us go to God and pray. Our Father in heaven, we come before you, Lord, with humble hearts, grateful for the sacrifice that your Son made on our behalf. We acknowledge, Lord, 
that although he was innocent and pure, he took on upon himself the sins of the world and was obedient to your command. As we examine ourselves, Father, we pray that we make things right. It's not of our ability that can cleanse us, but it's truly your son's body and his blood that can make us clean. We pray, Lord, that again, as we partake of this bread, it represents his body, that we may do it in a manner that is acceptable to you. These things we ask and pray for in Jesus' name. Amen. This time, if you pull back the second layer of the kit, we'll give you access to the fruit of the vine. Let's give our thanks for the cup. Our Lord in heaven, once again, we come before you, Lord, grateful for your son, for the life that he lived, for the sacrifice that he made for us, Father. We acknowledge that it's his blood that was shed on Calvary, dear Lord, that can make us clean unto your sight. And we pray that we Take this in a manner that is pleasing and acceptable unto your son. For it's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. You can then place the empty kit back into the bag and disclose of it on your way out. Separate and apart from it, we take this time to give back a portion of our blessings for those that are watching remotely know that our uh, paypal account is still accessible being one of the means or you can still mail your uh, offering in and you can store it from when you come together with us let us bow And Heavenly Father, we come before you, Lord, with humble hearts, acknowledging, Father, that everything we have, from our finances to our health, to our talents, to our family, they're all indeed gifts and blessings from you, Lord. And as we give back a portion of those blessings, we pray, Father, that we may do it with a cheerful, and humble hearts with a given desire out of joy, not out of obligation. We acknowledge, Father, we could never repay the gift that was given to us with your son. And we pray that you bless those funds that are collected here today, Lord. Be with the overseers of those funds. Give them wisdom and guidance and how they can better utilize those funds further your work in this community. These things we ask and pray for in Jesus' name. Amen. Please turn to mark your song books to hit number 603. 603 will be the song of invitation. And once you have that mark, turn with me to hymn number 324. Hymn number 324. Let's sing. 
The Lord's our rock, in Him we hide, a shelter in the time of storm. Secure whatever will be tied, a shelter in the time of storm. Oh, Jesus is a rock in a weary land, a weary land, a weary land. Jesus is a rock in a weary land, a shelter in the time of storm. A shade by day, defense by night, a shelter in the time of storm. No fears alarm, no foes affright, a shelter in the time of storm. Oh, Jesus is a rock in a weary land, a weary land, a weary land. Jesus is a rock in a weary land, a shelter in the time of storm. The raging storms may round us beat, a shelter in the time of storm. We'll never leave our safe retreat, a shelter in the time of storm. Oh, Jesus is a rock in a weary land, a weary land, a weary land. Jesus is a rock in a weary land, a shelter in the time of storm. Oh, rock divine, no oh, refuge dear, a shelter in the time of storm. Be thou our helper ever near, a shelter in the time of storm. Oh, Jesus is a rock in a weary land, a weary land, a weary land. Jesus is a rock in a weary land, a shelter in the time of storm. Say good morning to you, tell you how great it is to, to be here, indeed how great it is to see everyone out this morning, and together to experience another glorious first day of the week, we can all come together and worship our Heavenly Father in spirit and truth. It is indeed a great privilege for us to, to be here, to come out and bow our heads and bend our knees and practice obeisance and worship to our great God and our Father through his Son, Jesus the Christ. And this morning I want to talk to you briefly on the subject, what the resurrection means, what the resurrection, what it means. If you would, go with me to our Heavenly Father in prayer. Our God and Father, we thank you and we praise you again for blessing us to be here and affording us the privilege, Lord, of, of worshiping you. And indeed, as it was said, it's an awesome thing to not only be your children, Lord, but to be able to render sacrificial worship to you to render unto you, Lord, this, these great acts of, of reverence to you and for you, Lord, through your Son, to accept these, Lord, for these to be to you as a sweet-smelling savor. We're so grateful, Lord, and we pray now that as we study your word, as we sit at your feet, Lord, to learn of you and to develop a greater reverence for you, that our minds are focused and our hearts are receptive and that we are learning the value, Lord, of preparing our hearts to receive your word through meekness, knowing that, Lord, 
your implanted word has the ability to save our souls, and it's the only thing that can save us, dear Father. We pray that we're learning the value of looking past the speaker with his weaknesses and many shortcomings, Lord, and many in various ways, and that we're learning the value, Lord, every day of looking to you, realizing that everything that is good and right and true and eternal belong to you and all the mistakes, Lord. All the mistakes belong to the speaker. These things we pray and ask in Jesus' name. Amen. To most nations that were in the first century, the concept of good news or an announcement of some gospel meant two main ideas. Again, before we get into what the gospel means to us, think about in the ancient world of the first century that the gospel did not originate with the apostles or with the church, that the gospel was a common concept and it carried two main ideas. Before the apostles took the gospel of Jesus Christ into all the world was a common, a common thought. In the mind of those in the ancient world, an announcement of some gospel, when they heard some good news, it usually meant, number one, that there was good news coming from the house of the ruler that presided over that particular land. So that's what they thought about when they thought about it, when they heard good news, is that whatever ruler or whatever king which was over that region, that good news pertained to his house. But not only that, that good news usually had to do with either the birthday of that ruler or the ascension of a new ruler receiving his power. It's what they thought about in terms of the good news. And so when the apostles mention the gospel of God, again, this gospel, this idea, this concept being one that was common in that day, when the apostles mentioned the gospel of God concerning what? His son, you have to understand that the ancient world automatically associated those words and those concepts with God making what? A grand announcement concerning his son. This is why in Mark chapter 1, for example, and you don't always find this in the New Testament scriptures. Everybody turn your Bibles in Mark chapter 1, for example, and look at what, how the Bible puts it. The Bible says in Mark 1 verse 1, the beginning of the good news of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. So in essence, what is he talking about? He's, a talk, he's talking about God having some good news, making a grand proclamation concerning what? His house pertaining to what? His son, the ascension of his son. In Romans chapter 1, which is the book that we're studying uh, primarily today, turn to Romans chapter 1. This is why the Apostle Paul opens up this letter to these particular believers in the manner in which that he does. Look at what he says in verse number 1 of Romans chapter 1. Paul says, Paul, a servant of Jesus Christ, called to be an apostle, set apart for the gospel of God, which he promised beforehand through his prophets in the Holy Scriptures, the gospel concerning his son. So again, Paul is, is making reference to the gospel or the good news being what, a, a grand proclamation, a, a glorious announcement. And since the resurrection is the central theme to the good news, now think about this. The, since the resurrection of Jesus Christ is the central theme to the good news of God, we tend to refer and to explain the resurrection as the good news. But at the very least, and I'm not saying that that is wrong, but I'm just simply saying concerning all that we're talking about, at the very least, we should also view the resurrection. And we also ought to understand it as the declaration or the announcement of some great heavenly event. We, we ought to. And this is what the New Testament scriptures in the passages that we read this morning intend to really uh, impress into our minds. The fact that the raising of Jesus from the dead was God's way of announcing Jesus, 
his son's coronation and his ascension to the throne. That's what the, the resurrection is about. And I want us to, to really think about that, and I want to impress that into our hearts that the resurrection of Jesus Christ, his, his death in accordance to the scriptures, the fact that he was buried and that he was raised on the third day in accordance to the scriptures, that raising from the dead, Jesus standing again, what it denotes that God is making a grand announcement concerning the coronation and the ascension to power concerning his glorious son. We have to understand, for example, in Psalm 16, verse 10, that the prophets predicted this day that there would be, what, the resurrection of, of the Messiah, the resurrection of God's son, or the coronation of God's son in Psalm 16, verse 10. But not only that, in Psalm 49, verse 15, the same concept. Now, David had, uh, it, when he talked about these things, uh, by inspiration, they had an immediate context to his own life, but then ultimately it, these things are fulfilled through the Lord Jesus the Christ himself. So the prophets predicted this day when God's son would what? When he would ascend and when he would, would take throne, when he would be coronated. But Jesus himself foretold it. We see it in the scriptures over and over again. And the apostles, they preached this doctrine. When we see the apostles going into the world, when they preach the gospel, the central theme of the gospel, even in the first century, and starting in the first century was what? Was the resurrection of Jesus the Christ. In essence, they were what? When they said that we proclaim to you the good news of God's son, Jesus Christ, they were saying that we're telling you that there was a day that God coronated his son, that, that God's son ascended to the throne, to the right hand of God. And the first century world, whether it was Jews or whether it was Gentiles, they understood that when the, when the apostles said that this is good news concerning God's son, that there was the implication that God announced some glorious things concerning his house and his son. This is what the writer of Hebrews is speaking about in Hebrews chapter 1, a familiar passage to us. But, but we have to understand what the writer of Hebrews is saying. And when he quotes Psalm 2, he is talking about Jesus ascending to the throne. Jesus, on that day when he was resurrected and when he uh, ascends to the right hand of God, that, that God is making and God had made a grand and a glorious announcement concerning his one and only son. Hebrews chapter 1, look at verses 1 through 5. The writer puts it this way. He says, long ago, God spoke to our ancestors in many and various ways by the prophets, but in these last days, he has spoken to us by son, whom he appointed heir of all things, through whom he also created the worlds. He is the reflection of God's glory and the exact imprint of God's very being, and he sustains all things by his powerful word. When he had made purification for sins, when he died on the cross, when he shed his blood, and when he was raised, and when he ascended, in other words, to the throne, what happens? When he ascended, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high, having become as much superior to angels as the name he has inherited is more excellent than theirs. And I love that, that term, the name that he has inherited. It's telling us, and Paul's going to say the same thing, similar things, in Romans chapter 1, that Jesus is the rightful heir to these things because he's what? He's a son. But look at what he goes on to say. For to which of the angels did God ever say, you are my son? In other words, there was a day, there was an event that marked these things where God proclaimed to the world, what? About Jesus, that you are my son. Today I have what? begotten you or again I will be his father and he will be my son I submit to you today that when these things took place it was at the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ and then his ascension to the, the right hand of God so the words of Matthew the gospel writer should be understood in this way that we're talking about today when we look at Matthew for example chapter 28 and I'm going to ask you to turn there in Matthew chapter 28 when we see these words, beginning with verse number one, 
as beautiful as these things are, we need to understand that when we see the power of God being exercised and on display here in the raising of his son, we need to think about all of the glorious things that the scriptures teach us, but included in that is we need to think about the fact that Jesus is making his ascension to the throne as well. That there's a grand announcement that God is making that God made when he raised his son from the dead. In, in Matthew chapter 28, verse 1, the Bible says, After the Sabbath, as the first day of the week was dawning, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary went to see the tomb, and suddenly there was a great earthquake. Look at God's power. God is making a grand announcement. There's an earthquake, for an angel of the Lord descended from heaven, came and rolled back the stone and sat on it. His appearance was like lightning and his clothing white as snow. For fear of him, the guards shook and became like dead men. But the angel of the Lord said to the women, Do not be afraid. I know that you are looking for Jesus who was crucified. Look at verse 6. He is not here, for he has been raised as he said. Come see the place where he lay or where he used to lay. Isn't that powerful? So the words of Matthew should be understood in the way that we're talking about this morning. As, as a, a grand and a glorious proclamation from God's house, just like they did in, in the ancient days when a ruler or a king wanted to make an announcement or that there was another uh, ruler taking, taking the throne, maybe his, his son, or some grand announcement from his house, we ought to understand that God is, is giving good news to the world and making a glorious proclamation concerning his house as well. But the way that the majority of the world looks at this event, the celebration of this event for one day, is unscriptural. Let me say that again. What the majority of the world is doing, how the vast majority of the religious world looks at the resurrection and recognizes it for one day and at one day, it's unscriptural because the Bible does not teach that there is a day, one day out of 365 days that we ought to observe, that we ought to recognize, and that we ought to give glory to God for raising his son. There is no scripture for this day in our nation's concept or in the world's concept of Easter where for just this one day we praise God for the raising of his son. I'm telling you that it's an everyday thing. That's what the Bible teaches. This is why we remind you this morning what the resurrection means. Not just for those of us that are in here, but for the whole world. What the resurrection means. And so today I want us to consider three things concerning this, this particular idea. What the resurrection means. Number one, what the resurrection means is that every nation must come to him by obedient faith. And every individual of that particular nation, whatever nation that they may be, whatever so-called race one may affiliate himself with or herself with, whoever you are, this means, the fact that Jesus was raised means that you ought to come to him by obedient faith. In other words, if we believe, and please hear me, if you claim to believe that Jesus died and that he was raised from the grave on the third day, and scripture already said that the resurrection was heaven's declaration of his ascension, heaven's announcement of his ascension to power, then we are therefore acknowledging that he has the right to do what? To demand of us our allegiance and our obedience. In other words, if you say that I believe that Jesus died in accordance with the scriptures, I believe that he was buried and that he was raised on the third day in accordance with the scriptures, you are acknowledging that God made a glorious declaration from heaven that his son has ascended to the throne and you are declaring that you must obey him, that he has the right to command you to obey him. See, this is what the, the idea of the resurrection entails as well. It's not just about a single day that we come and that we worship God. It's really an acknowledgement of God every single day. This is what we are acknowledging when we acknowledge the resurrection. Whenever we confess the fact that Jesus was raised from the dead, we are confessing his power over our lives because we're saying that one has ascended to the throne that is able to what? And that he has the ability and the power to command and direct our lives. 
The resurrection is more than just proof that Satan's plan against the son failed. That is true. Satan's plan failed and it was thwarted. That is, is unequivocally true. But the resurrection implies more than that. The fact that, that the resurrection has to do with death not being able to hold Jesus is a glorious and a beautiful thing, but there's more to consider than just that. All of that is true, but the resurrection is also proof that Jesus is both what? Lord and Master. This is what the resurrection means as well. This is fundamental to the resurrection, that he is Lord and that he is Master. Look at what the Apostle Paul says. Let's go back to Romans chapter number one. And let's look at it very carefully. And in the time that we have, consider what, what the Apostle Paul is teaching to the Roman believers in his day, but really to all of the world. And this is the message that the Apostle Paul preached wherever he went. Romans chapter one, look at verses one through six again. It says, Paul, a servant of Jesus Christ, called to be an apostle. Paul says, in terms of my life, I was set apart for the gospel of God, which he promised beforehand through his prophets in the Holy Scriptures. In other words, the Old Testament prophets, they prophesied about all of these things that God would have a message that he would take throughout the world. We'll get to that in a moment. He says in verse 3, the gospel or the good news concerning his Son, so God is telling us right at the mouth of Paul, by the inspiration of the Holy Spirit through the mouth of Paul, who this gospel is, is pertaining to is God's one and only Son, who was descended from David according to the flesh and was declared to be Son, the, to be son of God with power according to the Spirit of holiness. How did God declare this? By what? By resurrection from the dead. Jesus Christ our Lord, through whom we have received grace and apostleship to bring about what? The obedience of faith among all Gentiles for the sake of his name. Look at verse 6. Including yourselves who are called to belong to Jesus Christ. To all God's beloved in Rome who are called to be saints, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. You guys see that? Isn't that powerful? That's a glorious thing. This means that as son. This means that as son, we must obey him as we would what? The father. Because God is the one that raised him from the dead and tells us about his power and what the resurrection means. By raising him from the dead, you see it in your Bibles as well that God declared him to be son. This is what the writer of Hebrews was talking about. God said, this is my one and only son. And if he's God's son, we must obey him in the same way that we must obey who? God the Father. This is what the Apostle Paul implies here powerfully. This is why baptism, this is what baptism symbolizes. Really think about that. This is what baptism symbolizes. All that we've talked about, this ascension to Jesus Christ and to the throne, his resurrection, this is what this is what baptism symbolizes, all that we've mentioned this morning. This is why baptism is essential to salvation because it acknowledges all of these things. When a person is baptized into Christ, it's, it's not about getting wet. As Peter says in 1 Peter, it's not about a bath. It is an acknowledgement of all the things that we talked about today. That Jesus, upon his resurrection, that, that, that God is, is making a powerful and a glorious and a life-saving declaration concerning his son. Look at, look at Romans chapter 6 if you don't believe me. And look at how Paul, again, by inspiration, puts these things. Paul says, what then are we to say? Romans chapter 6. What then are we to say? Should we continue in sin in order that grace may abound? By no means. How can we who died to sin go on living in it? Do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? Therefore, we have been buried by baptism into his death. So that 
Just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, so we too might walk in newness of life. Look at verses 3 again. Look at verse 3 again. Do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? Therefore we have been buried with him by baptism into death, so that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, so we too might walk in newness of life. For if we have been united with him in a death like his, we will, be, we will certainly be united with him in a resurrection like his. Paul is, is again telling us about the significance of baptism. And he is, is, is telling us that just as Jesus died in accordance with the scriptures, was buried and was raised on the third day, in accordance with the scriptures, when we are baptized, we are baptized into his death so that we can do what? Rise to walk in newness of life. That's why he goes on to say, consider yourselves dead to sin. And so when you're baptized into Christ, you are acknowledging again all that we've talked about this morning, the fact that Jesus at his resurrection was declared to be son by his resurrection and that he has the right and the ability to guide and direct your life and to command you to follow him in your life. This is why the apostle Paul and the rest of the apostles went into all of the world and preached the gospel starting with the resurrection. The heart of their message was the resurrection. This again, this is what Paul says in Romans chapter one, verse number one, when he says a servant of Christ Jesus called to be an apostle set apart for the gospel of God because everywhere that they went, they preached the gospel of Jesus the Christ, announcing to the world that God had appointed his son and his son ascended to the throne. They preached it everywhere. First to Israel, for example, in Acts chapter 2, verses 32 through 36, the Bible is just recording the day of Pentecost as Peter preaches to, to these nations of Israel. He's, in verse 32, the Bible says, this Jesus God raised up. This is Peter speaking. And of that, all of us are witnesses, being therefore exalted at the right hand of God and having received from the Father the promise of the Holy Spirit, he has poured out this that you both see and hear. For David did not ascend into the heavens, but he himself says, The Lord said to my Lord, Sit at my right hand until I make your enemies your footstool. Therefore let the entire house of Israel know with certainty that God has made him, Jesus, both Lord and Christ, Lord and Messiah, this Jesus whom you crucified. So the, the, the apostles went into the Jewish world, and they preached this glorious gospel. They, they let the whole Jewish world know about this glorious event. And they declared Jesus as resurrected and as son of God sitting at the right hand of God. And then they preached it as well to all of the Gentile world. In Acts chapter 17, again, for example, as Paul is, as what we know on Mars Hill, as he's preaching to these Athenians, he's preaching to them about the resurrection of Jesus the Christ. The Bible says not everyone accepted it, but Paul still preached the truth concerning the gospel of God's one and only son. And in Acts 17, verse 16, the Bible says that while Paul was waiting for them in Athens, waiting for, for, for his, his, his own uh, young men that he mentored, Timothy and Silas, the Bible says that while he was waiting for them in Athens, he was deeply distressed to see that the city was full of idols. So he argued in the synagogue with the Jews. He starts in the, in the synagogue first, and the devout persons, and also in the marketplace, every day with those who happened to be there. Also, some Epicureans and Stoic philosophers debated with him. Some said, what does this babbler want to say? Others said, he seems to be a proclaimer of foreign divinities. This was because he was telling the good news about Jesus and the resurrection. So they took him and brought him to the Areopagus and asked him, may we know what this new teaching is that you are presenting? It sounds rather strange to us so that we would like to know what it means. Now, all the Athenians and the foreigners living there would spend their time in nothing but telling or hearing something new, but the Apostle Paul brought to them what? The gospel, the good news concerning the resurrection of Jesus the Christ. Paul said, that the gospel was promised beforehand. And in Romans chapter one, the, the gospel was promised beforehand through the prophets. 
In Isaiah chapter 52, verses 7 through 10, we see the prophet Isaiah talking about the fact that one day God will send messengers throughout the world proclaiming the gospel, the good news concerning his son in order for the world to be comforted and to be saved. And so if you believe that he was raised, whomever you are, whether you're here today physically or whether you're listening virtually, if you believe that he was raised, you then must also obey him by faith from the heart. You have to obey him from the heart. He has authority over all men. Jesus has authority over all people. He has authority over all men and all people of all nations. And again, this is why the Apostle Paul says in this same chapter, in Acts chapter 17, in verse number 30, look at what he says here. He says, it, he puts it this way. While God has overlooked the times of human ignorance, now he commands all people everywhere to repent because he has fixed a day on which he will have the world judged in righteousness by a man whom he has appointed, and on this he has given assurance to all by raising him, what? From the dead. We all must obey him, whomever you are. Wherever you are, you must obey him. And so the resurrection means that all men everywhere must obey him. But the resurrection, number two, means that he is able to protect the church. He's able to protect us. And he's promised to protect us. In Ephesians chapter 1, verses 15 through 22, we see this glorious, this glorious truth that his resurrection means that he has promised that he is able and that he is willing to protect his church. See, his protection is among all the glorious spiritual blessings that the Apostle Paul is mentioning in Ephesians chapter 1, beginning with verse number 1, all the way to verse 14. And Paul mentions a, a, a glorious a glorious amount of, of blessings and an inheritance that we as Christians receive, that God has prepared for the church. Uh, spiritual blessings that await us in the heavenlies. Paul describes that as he opens up this book to the believers in Ephesus. But God is also, and Paul mentions this, he is also able to, as he has promised, to protect us until the day of our inheritance. Until that day our hope is realized he is able to protect us. And we ought to be glad that when we see the resurrection, when we read passages like Matthew 28, when we carry these truths in our heart every single day, because you have to carry them every day to, to, to battle the onslaught of the devil. You have to carry these truths every day. It's not enough for us to carry the resurrection or to observe the resurrection on a single day throughout the year. We have to carry it with us every day so that we can remember that his resurrection means that he is able, that he is willing to protect us until we receive our glorious and our heavenly inheritance. This is what it also means. God is a God of action. Paul is, is speaking about this in, in Ephesians. When it comes to the church, when it comes to what the Apostle Paul is teaching, God is a God of action. And he has proven to us that he is able and that he is willing through his son to protect us. Look at Ephesians chapter 1. Look at verses 15 through 22. And, and notice what Paul says here. Again, by inspiration. He says, I have heard of your faith in the Lord Jesus and your love toward all the saints. And for this reason, Paul says, I do not cease to give thanks for, for you as I remember you in my prayers. Paul says, I pray for you concerning your faith and your love. And because you are a part of God's family, I pray for you constantly. He says, verse 17, I pray that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give you a spirit of wisdom and revelation as you come to know him. In other words, he says, that I pray that God will give you a, a, an attitude that makes your heart ready to receive the glorious truths of God's word. He says, I pray that God will give you this, this attitude and this mind that is eager and that desires to know and to understand all concerning God's glorious inheritance and what God has prepared through his son for the church. All that God wants to give to the church through his son. I pray, Paul says, that you can understand these things, that your heart is, is ready to receive these things by faith, or that you will have a spirit of wisdom and revelation as you come to know him so that with the eyes of your heart enlightened 
you may know what is the hope to which he has called you. What are the riches of his glorious inheritance among the saints? And then look at what he says, number three. And what is the immeasurable greatness of his power for us who believe? Look at those again. Look at verse 17. He says, I pray that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give you a spirit of wisdom and revelation as you come to know him. Why, Paul? Number one, so that you're, with the eyes of your heart enlightened, you may know what is the hope to which he has called you. Number one. But number two, what are the riches of his glorious inheritance among the saints? And then number three, and what is the immeasurable greatness of his power for us who believe? How did Paul, how did God display this? By the working of his great power. In other words, I hope that you will come to know God's power by the working of his power. That God will show you his power every day in your lives. And then look at what Paul says by inspiration. Look at what he says. God, verse 20, put this power to work in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly places. Paul says, you ought to know God's power and what he can do for your life. And God shows you what he can do by what? By raising his son from the dead. What the resurrection means is that God's power is, is effective for you and it is able to what? Protect you. That's what we ought to think about when we think about the resurrection. The fact that God is able to protect us in this world that, that seeks to destroy us. That ought to be, that's the good news. That ought to be good news to all of us. That God is able to hold us in his hand and that nothing that the devil has for us can, can, can hurt us. If we stay in him. If we, we, we dwell in him by faith. There is no power. There is no spiritual authority. There is nothing that exists that can harm us spiritually, that can snatch us away from him if we remain in him. There is nothing stronger than God. Look at what Paul goes on to say. We have to read all of this. He says, God put this power to work in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at the right hand in the heavenly places, far above all rule. If Christ is over all rule and all authority and all power and all dominion and all na every name that is named, not only in this age, but also in the age to come, then what do you and I have to worry about if we're in him? What do we have to worry about? And he has put all things, all power, all authority, whatever you can name, whether in this life or spiritually, it's all been placed under his feet and he has made him the head over all things. Why? For the church, for us. That's the good news. That's part of the resurrection too. And he has displayed this glorious power through the raising his son from the dead, which is his body, the church is his body, the fullness of him who fills all in all. We ought to be, be glad today and be encouraged today. This is why the writer in Ephes I'm sorry, in Hebrews chapter two says this. He puts it this way. In, in, in Hebrews chapter 2, verses 5 through 9, he says, Now God did not submit the coming world about which we are speaking to angels. These, these last days and when things pertaining to the church, not to angels, but someone has testified somewhere, what are human beings that you are mindful of them or mortals that you care for them? You have made them for a little while lower than the angels. You have crowned them with glory and honor subjecting all things under their feet. Now listen to what the writer says. Now in subjecting all things to them, God left nothing outside their control. He's telling us what we are in Christ Jesus, okay? As it is, we do not yet see everything in subjection to them. To what? To human beings. But we do see Jesus. So in other words, if you want to know what power you have in this world, he says that if you, you need to look at Jesus. Understand Jesus because what? As he is on the throne, then guess what? We reign with him. We reign with him. He says, we do see Jesus, who for a little while was Lord than the angels, now crowned with glory and honor because of the suffering of death, so that by the grace of God he might taste death for everyone. Jesus is at the right hand of God's majesty, and we reign with him. So what do we have to worry about? He's protecting us. The resurrection means that he is able to protect us. And then finally, the resurrection means that we will see this power again on display. 
There will be a day when we will see this power again. Now, we're over time, but I want us to turn very quickly to Philippians chapter 3 and look at what verse 17, what Paul says. We need to be encouraged. The resurrection means that we will see this power again. In other words, he didn't raise Jesus and leave it at that, but there are some glorious promises that have been made to us. And so Paul says in Philippians 3, verse 17, Brothers, join in imitating me and observe those who live according to the example you have in us. For many live as enemies of the cross of Christ. I have often told you of them, and now I tell you even with tears. Their end is destruction. Their God is the belly, and their glory is in their shame. In other words, those who live for this life and who live for self, there is a penalty that they will pay for these things. Their minds are set on earthly things, but our citizenship is in heaven. And because our citizenship is in heaven and our mind, as Paul says in Colossians chapter 3, verse 1, our minds are set on, on heavenly things, he says then it is from there that we are expecting a Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. He will transform the body of our humiliation or our humble bodies that it may be conformed to the body of his glory. Look at what he says, by the power that also enables him to make all things subject to himself. This power that God has put on display in raising his son, God will display it again when he does what? When he raises us, when he resurrects us and transforms our bodies. Therefore, my brothers, whom I love and long for, my joy and my crown, stand firm in the Lord in this way. And it ought to spur us to stand firm in him. The resurrection also means that we will see this power again. So if you're here today and you have not obeyed the gospel, we're going to urge you today to obey the gospel of Jesus Christ. Again, you saw it in Romans chapter 1, verses 1 through 6, that the whole purpose of Jesus raising, that the purpose of Jesus being raised from the dead was so that he could have authority over your life. You ought to give him that authority. If you acknowledge his resurrection, you ought to acknowledge his power as well and obey the glorious gospel of Jesus Christ through faith, repentance, confession, and being baptized into Christ for the remission of your sins. And if you are a Christian today and you need to come for the reasons that we spoke of or for anything else, won't you come right now? Why would you get stand and why would you sing?
Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection. What has it given us? This is Romans 6, 22 and 23. It says, But now, having been set free from sin, and having become slaves of God, you have your fruit to holiness, and in the end, everlasting life. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. Will you bow with me? Our God and Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for all your many blessings you give us each and every day of our life. From the protection we have, your comfort, and the peace we can have as being a child of God. And most of all, we want to thank you for your precious Son and the gift he has given us, that through him we have the hope of eternal life. And as we come to a close of this worship service, it is truly our hope that we have done everything acceptable and pleasing in your sight, most importantly when we gathered around the table and remembered your son. Thank you for the message Brian gave us today. Let Brian continue to be inspired and motivated to give us a sermon each and every day of, his, of the week and um, be with his family that you're always watching over each and every one of them. And let us continue to pray for the ones on our prayer list, our family and our friends, and really the world, that you will comfort and heal and protect each and every one of us, and let us always continue to pray for one another. And as we depart from here, let us forgive us of our many shortcomings, Pick us up when we fall. Let us remember who we are and who we represent in the race we're running and the fight we're fighting. It's in your precious son Jesus' name that we pray. Amen.